against their husband. They committed fornication by going by abandoning the uh, abandoning God and His law covenant with them, and instead uh, following these other gods. And so, really, when it comes to this list here, if you look at your thought life and you look at the spiritual part of it as well, um, all of us commit these works of the flesh, and none of us are prone, we can't escape it um, except by if we are led by the Spirit. Um, so, your next point on your outline is because you are not doing these things in your soul and your spirit, you're really doing them through your sin nature and the works of the flesh working through you. The next point is that you cannot lose your eternal life by doing the works of the flesh because you are dead to the law. Your salvation is complete in Christ. You cannot lose your eternal life by doing the works of the flesh because you are dead to the law your salvation is complete in Christ and this gets back to the identity part that we talked about last week uh, if we go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 19 we talked last week about how once you're saved that all this your sins are covered under the blood that you are buried by baptism into Christ's death and that you are raised to new life as Christ was raised since Christ put to death the old man was crucified with Christ that means you are dead to the law and it says here in Galatians 2 verse 19 for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And this gets back to your identity. Once you are saved, the old man is crucified with Christ. That body of sin is destroyed. The law, according to Colossians 2, is nailed to the cross. And if you do sin, then it's not really you doing it, but rather it's your sin nature doing it through the flesh. And you can see that here in these verses. You're dead to the law. You're crucified with Christ. And the, any living that you do is, according to verse 20 there, it's Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So when you do make the choice to walk in the Spirit, then the life that you live is by the faith of the Son of God working through you. Again, it's the faith with work, which worketh by love, as you believe the doctrine and allow that doctrine to work through you. We go over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We see that we have eternal life in Him. Because we are placed into the body of Christ, our identity is in Him. And since Christ's death was sufficient to take care of all of our sins and nail them to the cross and nail that sin nature to the cross, then the conclusion is is found in Colossians 2.10. It says, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. The conclusion then is that you are complete in Him, being hid in Christ. Therefore, if any sin that you do, it's not really you doing it, it's already covered by the blood, it's the sin nature working through you. You as a new creature in Christ, as part of the body of Christ, are complete in Him. Verse 11 says, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Uh, you can see this is a spiritual circumcision. The Galatians were told that you had to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. Paul says in Galatians 5 and in Galatians 6 that circumcision avail, it doesn't avail anything. It doesn't matter. And the reason is because the physical circumcision was done away with, with the, with the cross of Christ. And for us, it says there, there is a circumcision, but it's a spiritual circumcision. It's a circumcision made without hands. A circumcision is the cutting off of the flesh, and that's what it is spiritually for us when we trust in the blood of Christ to save us. There is a spiritual circumcision, according to Colossians 2.11, 
and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So that's why when you do a sin, it's not really you doing it anymore. There is this separation or this cutting off as far as God is concerned, spiritually speaking. You, you, th you think of a physical circumcision and you think of what they do. They cut off that flesh. That flesh is no more part of that body. Uh, it's dead. It's cut off. It's done away with. That's how God sees you spiritually with, as in terms of your flesh and the sin nature. Once you've trusted in the blood of Christ to save you, according to Colossians 2.11, there is a circumcision made without hands that has put off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So you think of that physical circumcision, that's what's happened spiritually. Spiritually, uh, you know, we've still got that sin nature that's sitting around in us. We still have our vile flesh. Uh, there's still no good thing in it. We all uh, still do commit sins. But as far as God is concerned, the sin nature, the, the, the flesh, has been cut off from the new creature that you have been made by your identity being hid in Christ. And so... You know, just like that physical flesh is cut off in a physical circumcision, what, that, what happens to that physical piece of skin that's been cut off has nothing to do with your body anymore. It's not attached to your body anymore. It's, it's a completely different thing. It's gone. It's dead. And that's how God sees you spiritually now. He says the body of the sins, the sin nature that you have, and your flesh, it's still there, certainly, but it's been cut off from the new creature that you are in Christ. And so if you end up sinning, that's not part of who you are in Christ. That's just like that physical flesh is not part of the body. Spiritually speaking, that sin nature and the body of the sins and the sins that you do by trying to fulfill the law is not a part of you anymore. It's been cut off, done away by the circumcision of Christ. Uh, and so that's really why you can't lose your salvation, why you can't do the works of the flesh, because... Spiritually speaking, God says that that's not a part of you anymore. That sin nature and the flesh has been cut off. It's dead. It's not part of the new cre creature, the new creation that you are in Christ. Your life is hid in Christ. So when you do sins, He doesn't even recognize it. It's not part of who you now are. Um, if we continue in Colossians 2 and verse 14, He says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So it's done away with. He cut it off. It's gone. The body of sins that you did, the sin that you'll do in the future, it's gone. It's not a part of you. It's just the sin nature working out through there. Sort of like an illustration you think of, and being in country here, if you think of a chicken, uh, they say, you know, they talk about a chicken running around with its head cut off, and then eventually, you know, if you cut off the head of the chicken, uh, the chicken can still run around for a little bit there, uh, but, but eventually it just turns over and it dies. The actions of the chicken after that happens, it's not really, the, the chicken's already dead, but it's still running around a little bit. It can still do that because, um, you know, it takes a, a few seconds there and then, then eventually it dies. Well, you can think of that sort of with your flesh as well. Uh, certainly you can still do sin and do the actions uh, under the law and do these works of the flesh, but as far as God is concerned, it's not you doing it anymore because your sin nature has been cut off, just like that head of the chicken, and the flesh is dead uh, as far as God is concerned, but yet there's still this working out until the redemption of your bodies, and then the flesh is changed, and then you won't sin anymore. But in the meantime, you're just like a chicken with the head cut off as far as your flesh is concerned, in that you're not going to sin anymore because it's, and what happens if you do sin, it's just the works of the flesh working out through the sin nature uh, that's still working out until the time when you have the redemption of your body at the rapture. Um, that may be more of a graphic illustration, but I think it proves the point. Uh, if we continue in Colossians, if you look down in Colossians 3, he's talking about your identity here. And in Colossians 3 verse 1, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, uh, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. And now in verse 3, we're going to compare verse 3 to verse 5, and we'll see the difference here between 
how God views us spiritually, and then how we still have the flesh and the sin nature. In verse 3 he says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead. That's spiritually speaking. God looks at you and he says, that sin nature and the body of sin that's part of you, he says, that's dead. Ye are dead. That part of you is dead. And instead, he's risen you to new life in Christ, your, your inner man and the spirit within you, so that your life is hid with Christ in God. And he says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Then verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate and affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, you notice in verse 3, he told you, for ye are dead. That's the status of how your flesh is. The body of sins, the sin nature, as far as God is concerned, that's dead. It's put away. But yet in verse 5, you're told, mortify therefore your members. Well, mortify means to put to death. So, so what is it? In verse 3, you're told, ye are dead. But now in verse 5, it says, put to death your members. And that's the, the illustration with the chicken is, is the same here, is that uh, when that chicken's head is cut off, he is dead, but yet the, the motions of the flesh still continue for a little bit. And that's how God sees you. Spiritually speaking, you're, the body of sins destroyed, the flesh is gone, you are dead, but yet the motions of the flesh still continue until the rapture, and when that old flesh is replaced with the new flesh, and so, until that time, he says, put to death, or mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. So, uh, you have the capacity through the Holy Spirit working through you to put to death the members of the flesh, which God already sees as being dead spiritually, because for eternity, uh, it's already been settled since your identity is with Christ. So, if we go back to Galatians chapter 5 now, I think that... It will help us understand what we're going to read next here. If we look in verse 24. In Galatians 5, 24, this passage is another verse that is used to say that you can lose your salvation. It says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So people will say, well... Um, you know, you committed this sin, you lied to somebody, you cheated, you stole, you did these things. So then you must not be saved. You must have lost your salvation because you didn't crucify the flesh with the affections and lust. And what he's talking about here is, again, it's your identity. Your flesh, uh, in your fill in the blank here for chapter 5, verse 24, is that the flesh is crucified when we are saved. I realize I skipped one and we'll come back to that. Uh, but in chapter 5, verse 24, the flesh is crucified when we are saved. We just read that in Colossians 3, 3. Ye are dead. So when, it, when he says in Galatians 5, 24, they that have, are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust, that happened at the moment you were saved. Because as far as God is concerned, according to Colossians 3, 3, ye are dead. That's it. It doesn't say ye will be dead in the future when I redeem you, or you may be dead if I find out that you live out a godly life and so then I give you salvation. It doesn't say that. It says ye are dead. Once you have trusted in the blood of Christ to save you, ye are complete in Christ, and ye are dead as far as your flesh and the lust of the flesh and the sin nature is concerned. So when he says they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust, he is recognizing the status in the body of Christ that you have, that as far as God is concerned, the works of the flesh are gone, ye are dead. So you have already crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. It's nothing you did. It's not that you tried really hard to obey the law and you succeeded. It's not that. It's what we read about in Colossians 2. You trusted in the blood of Christ. When you did that, Christ says, okay, I've circumcised or I've cut off the body of the sins. It's destroyed. It's dead. The flesh and the affections and lust have been crucified. And any remnants of that is just taking place until you receive your glorified body. Um, and it's not really you doing it. It's the sin nature within you that's doing it. And so 
the point that Paul is making isn't you need to try really hard to obey the law, then you've crucified the flesh and then you're part of Christ. That's not what he's saying. Rather, he's making the point that you've already experienced this crucifixion of the flesh by trusting in the blood of Christ to save you. Since you've already experienced that, now you have the opportunity, as verse 25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You have the opportunity now where you can read the Scripture and before you were saved, you couldn't understand. You couldn't understand the doctrine of faith, hope, charity, and those things that are of God. You couldn't uh, allow Christ's love to work through you and show to others that you are a new creation in Christ. You didn't have that opportunity. Now though, since you live in the Spirit, since the Spirit is in you, then you have the opportunity to walk in the Spirit. Not to try real hard to obey the flesh, but to recognize your new identity and that the fruit of the Spirit can work through you. And that's what he says in verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so you're filling the blank there is the fruit of the Spirit is the result of believing mystery doctrine. It's the result of believing mystery doctrine. It's not by you trying hard, because we saw in, back there in verse 15 that if you try to obey, obey God through the lust of the flesh, you end up biting and devouring one another. And then in verse 26, in Galatians 5.26, we're told that if we do the works of the flesh, we're, um, it says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So if we try to obey God in the energies of our flesh, the result is verse 15, we bite and devour one another. And the result is verse 26, we provoke one another and we envy one another. That's quite different from verses 22 and 23, where it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Um, notice, notice the, and so really it comes about not by trying to obey the law, but it comes about by believing the mystery doctrine, believing what's in Paul's epistles. That's faith in the doctrine which works out the love of Christ through you. Uh, Galatians 5, 6 said it was faith which worketh by love. Notice the, the, uh, the verbiage here comparing verse 19 with verse 22. Verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are. Works is plural. And then are is plural. It doesn't say, it says the works, plural, of the flesh are. So this is a plural thing and he lists them. In other words, there are many works of the flesh. In verse 22, it says the fruit of the Spirit is. That's singular. If we had multiple, you know, he's list love, joy, peace, long suffering, etc. He gives this list. But it's not... In the works of the flesh, it was plural. The fruit of the Spirit, it's singular. There is one fruit. It doesn't say fruits. It says fruit, singular. And if it was fruits, it would say the fruits are. It doesn't say that. It says the fruit is. It's a singular fruit. There is only one fruit of the Spirit. And that's the first one listed. It's love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. You say, well, what about all these rest of them? Well, the rest of them are a result, they come from the love. So in Galatians 5, 6, when he says, he says, in Jesus Christ, it's faith which worketh by love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then in verse 22, when he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, then he lists all these other things, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are things contained within love. Um, we've done this before, so I won't do it again, but if you look in 1 Corinthians 13 and you go through the list and just in verses 4 through 7, you've got, it's talking about charity. That's God's love there. And then he talks about the things that are contained within charity. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, charity suffereth long. Well, there's long suffering. Fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 22, we're told love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And if you go through that list there in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, 
and you compare it to the list in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, what you'll find is that contained within charity or contained within love are all of these things listed after love here. That's why it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. So it's not something that you try to obey the law and do really good in the energies of your flesh. It's something that the Holy Spirit works out through you. And the Holy Spirit, when you learn the doctrine, the result of faith in that doctrine is the love of God working through you. And, this, and the result of that love then is all of these things that are listed here. The joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, goodness, faith. That's why there is no list of things for you to do. It's simply the Spirit working through you, that love of God. And that's why he said in verse 14, All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you have faith in the doctrine, you believe the mystery doctrine, the natural result is Christ's love coming through you. That's the fruit of the Spirit that works through you. And then you're going to love your neighbor. You're going to fulfill the law naturally. And the natural result of the law is all these things mentioned after love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And that's why the verse 23 concludes by saying, Against such there is no law. Because you fulfilled the law completely in that the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit working through you as you've read the doctrine, chose to believe it, and allowed the Holy Spirit to teach it to you. So it's not a law program, it's a love program. It's the love of God working through you as you have faith in the doctrine. So you're filling the blank on the fruit of the Spirit. I think I already gave it to you, but the fruit of the Spirit is the result of believing mystery doctrine. If you don't believe the doctrine, you don't have the faith. If you don't have the faith, you don't have the love of God. And if you don't have the love of God, then you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. So it all just comes down to opening up your Bible on a daily basis and reading it and believing it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says, I die daily. That's a dying to the flesh, and it's just by opening your Bible. You don't have to be a missionary, a pastor, a worship leader. You don't have to do all these good works. That's not what it's about. It's just simply every day going to your Bible and reading it and believing it. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit will teach you the things of God. He will naturally work out the love of God through you as your faith increases as you read the, the Scripture. And then the result of that love is... Fulfilling the law, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So here are the Galatians in this point where the Judaizers have told them, you got to obey the law of Moses. you got to be circumcised. you got to do all this stuff that's contained in the law. And Paul says, yeah, we're going to do that, but we're not going to do it in the energies of the flesh. We're going to do it by the Spirit. We're just going to believe the doctrine that's here. The faith will work out the love. And against the love of the Spirit working, the love of God that's worked through you, through the Spirit, worked through through you, the result is there is no law against that. So you wanna you wanna do what the Judaizers say, that that's fine. But we're not gonna do it by putting ourselves under the law of Moses. We'll do it by putting ourselves under the law of the Spirit, having faith in the doctrine, allowing the Spirit to work it through you, and that's really the only way that you're gonna accomplish it. Otherwise, you're gonna bite and devour one another you're going to provoke and envy one another. And so, I just wrote down here for your last two verses on your outline that if we reckon also ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, in other words, we're not going to try to serve God under the law, we reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, we will live in the Spirit. We will make the choice to mortify our members. And we do that not by trying real hard, but just by reading the doctrine and believing it and have faith in it, and the Holy Spirit works it out through us. And then the final point in verse 26, I wrote that a church living in grace and in the Spirit is living in God's love. But a church living in the law and in the flesh is living in envy. And you can experience that if you go to pretty much any church out there. There is at least some law element, even in those that teach eternal security, there will be a law element. And you'll see that the ones who give tithes to the church or have our church members in good standing or you know do service as a as a deacon or you know ushers or whatever they are they are somehow considered better Christians than the others 
even though the others may be, you know, you have a lot of people who maybe physically aren't able to be an usher or physically aren't able to serve that way, but they've had faith in God's Word and they read it every day. Somehow those people are less esteemed in the church than those who are doing these outward works. And the result of that then is really the law and the flesh and it works envy. Envy and the, the Christian walk that this good bishop or this good deacon has or this good usher or this good person who dresses up in their suit every day. I end up envying them because they're a better Christian than me somehow. It's the envy, it's the provoking, it's the biting and devouring that you'll see. But if if we abandon that system and just have faith in God's word rightly divided, we just believe what Paul says here and just read it every day. Maybe physically you're not able to be a missionary. You're not physically able to go and serve in other areas. But if you're reading it and you're believing it, the Holy Spirit's working it through you and it's working out the love of God in you and that fruit comes out and then there isn't the envy and the strife and the divisions, but rather it's the love of God working through you, the body working properly, and then people are, are saved as a result. I'll just read this one scripture that I love. If, if a church is operating like that, the result is, it says, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. It's the Satan's kingdom is brought low when the church as a whole works together in love. But if it's all about me looking good to the other people, then I end up biting, devouring, provoking, envying, and Satan's kingdom flourishes. And that's what we see in the United States today because the, the church is under the law rather than being led by the Spirit. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. Help us to believe it, to have faith in it. Even though our flesh lusts against the Spirit and says, I don't want to read my Bible, I don't want to believe it, I want to... I want to serve God and on my own. Help us to not have faith in that, but to have faith in your word and to continually die daily, choosing, making the choice to read your word, to believe it, to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us so that the fruit of the Spirit works and not the works of the flesh. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.